Hey Kit, if you want to send a um, request kit, lovely. Hi Kate. Hi yeah. Hello. Um, lovely. So um, Kate's just going to get herself set up, and then um, once she's ready to go, I'll um, I'll start. Good to so, go. Yeah, good to go. Great. So um, this won't be a, a Q and A as such tonight. More of a, a poetry reading. Um, but Kate, as you can see, um, is going to be doing some some BSL. So uh, Kate Labno is a BSL interpreter, and I'm really pleased that she's going to be interpreting my poem tonight. So my name is uh, Stephen Lightbound. I'm a, a Bristol-based Blackburn-born poet. Uh, I write poems about being a wheelchair user. Um, I think this is the fifth spoken pencil session that I've been doing during lockdown, just as a way of sharing some poems, um, talking about poems, talking to other poems, poets that I really like. Um, it's been really important to me to talk about access and disability as I've been doing these sessions and also to try and think about how we can make these sessions more accessible and so I'm really pleased that we can have um, Kate um, interpreting as I, as I go along and hopefully you can see you can see those um, interpretations behind the comments and hopefully that's okay. Um, so I'm going to read some poems tonight and uh, we thought long and hard about whether or not Tonight was still an appropriate night with everything that's going on at the moment. And um, I thought actually the best thing to do is is um, is still to kind of, yeah, to bring some poems to people that I think are probably still, you know, at, at home. There's people still in their houses and it's nice to be able to share, share poems and talk about, um, uh, yeah, and just and talk about poetry and talk about these things. And the, you'll see that I've pinned a comment in my um, comments and, and I'd really encourage you to go over to Twitter and look at a poem by Vanessa Kizule, who's the Bristol poet and uh, the Bristol poet for the city, I should say. And she's done an amazing poem about the statue of Edward Colston um, being brought down in Bristol on the weekend through the Black Lives Matter protests. And actually also um, after I finished at eight o'clock, uh, Dialogue Books, again, I've pinned that or um, having a conversation about uh, race and narratives. And I think that'd be a really interesting watch. I'm gonna try and watch that as well. But anyway, the information's there and I urge you to go and look at them. But I'm gonna read some poems. I'm gonna read some poems that I've not read before or I haven't read often before. Um, some of these are new poems. Some of these are old poems, but they'll be new to you. Um, some of these are, there's gonna be at least three poems from a new collection that I'm starting to write. Um, but I'm going to start with the first poem. And one of the things that I've noticed about uh, lockdown easing is potentially how uh, we could get back to some bad habits around inaccessibility and what it means to um, struggle to kind of get about if you're in a chair and get into shops and access. And I spotted this on at the weekend where coffee shops and shops that I've used to be able to get into, um, I can't access anymore because of the cues from being socially distant have kind of wind themselves downstairs and uh, steps and over curbs and it just means I can't access things so I've kind of been really thinking about that as I um, as I join back into the real world and I release myself from my home and I want to get my hair cut because this barn is getting very uh, dodgy um, and get a cup of coffee and anything else that everyone else is going to be able to do. And I think I'd just say it like the next time you're out and uh, you're in a queue and it's up a step, maybe you could say, did you know your queue isn't um, wheelchair accessible? And just see what their reaction is. Uh, I know there's a lot going on at the moment, but maybe just think about the shops that you're going into and the ones that have got steps. This, this poem is called Stairs. At the coffee shop, the need for beans with a hint of chocolate and privilege overtakes pleasantries. The door, a step, no wheelchairs, not here, not welcome. At the next shop, another step, a hairdresser, the salon washed in perspiration from your effort in getting this far, still not welcome. To the next door, 
You take your place in a queue behind a mobility scooter, a power chair, a pair of crutches. That's what everyone else sees. Only you see a father, a horse lover, a cosplayer. Why are you all queuing? Uh, that's why. This is the only building with level access. People walk past, your jaw hurts from clenching. You swallow their glances. Each one sits in your intestines. You need antacids to nullify the distress that follows you like a fight with a flight of stairs. You want to swallow the high street hall. A little boy asks, Mummy, why is that man in a wheelchair? She whispers something you cannot hear as they walk by. When you take your turn at the front of the queue, you realise all you can see is the back of the same head you were just staring at. And somehow you were back at the start, at the coffee shop, the hairdresser, an espresso shampoo with a hint of chocolate and perspiration. No wheelchairs, not here, not welcome. There is still no coffee, no haircut, no way in. Um, and to something still lockdown related, but this is a poem I wrote uh, a while ago, um, but it seems to connect with people um, who've been doing uh, yoga. I've been doing a lot of online yoga with various studios from Austin to Amsterdam to um, London. And it's been fantastic to reconnect with different parts of my body that I've not normally been able to, that I didn't think I could move to kind of touch my leg and feel connected to it in some way. And yoga has been a really good way of keeping uh, my mind clear and happy and um, healthy. And um, I first got into yoga maybe about five years ago, six years ago when I was unwell. And uh, like a lot of people who come across yoga, um, I came across via um, Yoga with Adrienne. And uh, I went to one of her live uh, classes in in London and uh, Paris which is all very exciting and on the way back from Paris on the Eurostar I wrote this poem and this is called Guided by the Voice. I fold my legs into a pigeon, lift them like a marionettist into a happy baby. Not once does anyone ask if the guy in a wheelchair in amongst the lycra is an interloper. I unfurl my reconstructed spine into a forward fold Head between knees as though embrace, brace. After the accident, I almost slipped into permanent corpse pause. Don't forget to breathe. My legs became still, but they didn't stop talking. My brain stopped listening. There is a voice still there below the line of no return. It's just softer, the energy different. They do want to be heard. With head bowed, I offer a barely audible apology. I'm sorry for all those years of resentment. A different voice, familiar, it guides through eagle arms. Find what feels good, it says. A room reaches forwards, feet on mat on one pair of wheels. Each one of us lost in our own cloud of incense, but connected, just do your best the voice says. I take my hand behind my knee and lift. Thanks. Um, so last year, my debut poetry collection, uh, a book called Only Air, about my experiences of being a wheelchair user, was published by Burning Eye Books. And um, I've been keen to just kind of crack on with the next collection. I didn't want to be a, a one book wonder. Um, oh, there wasn't much wonder, but uh, um, I wanted to um, write something slightly different. I didn't just want to write about my experiences. Um, and I guess in the, the current, it's interesting because at the moment, I think lots of people feel like um, we're living in a slightly dystopia where everything is out of reach and unaccessible. But actually for a lot of people with disabilities, actually the world has felt like a bit of a dystopia where you're kind of on the periphery of what's going on. Um, and particularly if you watch sci-fi or um, films where there's an apocalypse or something terrible happens or there's a horde of zombies, 
anyone with a disability tends to get left behind or eaten. Um, and I wanted to change that narrative. And I wanted to write the story of what would happen if um, there was a survivor of an apocalypse who was a wheelchair user. And so I've been writing these poems about someone that wakes up one day and realizes that he's the only survivor left, uh, or so he believes. And uh, he's a wheelchair user and he decides to set off and trek from uh, where he lives to the other side of the country. And this, this collection of poems that I'm writing is set across a year. So, um, and each poem is on a different day. So I'm going to read three poems from that book. So if you bear in mind, uh, this guy's a chair user, he's on his own, he's writing a different poem every day. And these poems are, um, he's starting to feel quite melancholy, quite sad about what's happening and wistful for people that he's lost and memories that he's lost. And uh, yeah, these three poems are about things that he's lost, people that he's lost and people that he's missing. And they all start with the, with the day number. So this is day 82. It's 82 days after the apocalypse happened. Day 82. New York, June 2014. On the High Line, we sat and watched the yellow procession on 10th Avenue make its way to Kong's last stand. You held a painting of a wiener dog we'd just bought from a street vendor. He asked where we were from. When we said London, he replied, man, that place, I freaking love Hernando's. I held a cinnamon bun in one hand and paired with the other. I asked you if the fat grilled chicken was a reason someone came to our capital city it was something we should be proud of. I'd wanted to tell him all the reasons why he should visit, but nothing came to mind. Why protect a place you spent this trip running away from? You had a point. A man wearing a Yankees cap spoke in German to his family as he ushered them into position for a family portrait. Click, beep, click, beep, click, beep, click. The fake shutter noise of his camera phone wrestled for attention over the car horns. We didn't need a camera to capture any of this. Can you still remember? Wherever you are, where are you now? All these details are so vivid, yet I can barely recall your face. Below us, we were drawn towards a man in a blue hard hat and a high-vis vest. We watched him stand in the middle of the road and wave passengers from sidewalk to sidewalk, functioning with deactivated nuclear energy. I tried to see from the way he waved his flag whether he was bored or fulfilled. I told you I'd take any job just to live here. Not one pedestrian acknowledged the man or the flag. I wanted to shout down, say anything. There was attitude on every corner, but I had never seen you so serene. Your maxi dress was pale green. It was the colour of absinthe and somehow was still, was still in the breeze coming off the Hudson. Old well, Blue Eyes was right. I did want to be a part of it. I looked in my wallet for more dollars. The feeling inside of me was ferocious. I need to find a breath to go again. I went back to the street vendor to see if I could buy more hours in that day because any would be preferable to this one. Day 86. I drink the juice from the tin peaches. I gulp down the survivor syndrome and ignore the urge to add cream and ladyfingers. Thinking of dessert doesn't seem right when I can't smile at you across our table raised on four yoga blocks so I can get my knees under. A small trickle of sugar water escapes from the tin and settles, settles in my beard. I leave it there. I fantasize about an exhausted bee replenishing itself on my chin. I wipe the sticky residue away with a grubby hand. I'm so bereft of contact that the thought of the bee returning to the hive revitalized is too much. Day 100. There's a naughty swear word in this. Day 100. There are things I thought I would miss, but don't. Like the way I thought I'd be desperate to fuck when I lost my legs, but all I wanted was to hold my wife and run my fingers over her like she was a blade of grass I didn't want to bend. The only difference between a creeping speedwell, a weed growing unapologetically in a lawn, and a hyacinth arranged in a hand-painted vase is the care it was placed there with. I'm 100 days in 
My urge to tend the weeds is strong. I want to tell them, wherever you are, you grow in all the right places. Thanks. So those are some new poems, slightly different to the ones I've been doing so far, but I'm enjoying writing them. I've bought a, a massive map of the UK and have been pinning little um, post-it notes on different places across the country just to make sure I don't say day 81 and he's in Birmingham and then day 83 is in, I don't know, Dover. Anyway, that's to come. Um, I'm going to read another poem now. This is a poem that was in a, an anthology last year um, called Poems from a Green and Blue Planet. And uh, this book was curated by uh, Sabrina Malfouz. And I was really um, chuffed to be asked to be in this um, uh, anthology. It's out by um, Hachette Books. Um, you can buy it from uh, all good bookshops. And um, it's a, a book of nature poems for children. And uh, I haven't written many poems for children. And so when I set about this one, I interviewed my nephew, um, who's five years old. And uh, I had a chat with him about trees and what he thinks about trees. And then uh, I turned it into a poem. So this is called, At Night I Talk to the Giant's Finger. We walk through the woods near my house on the way to the supermarket. I count 100 trees. Some are tall, some are small, some are green, others lean. All strong, very steady. They always know I am coming. I ask them what they see. I put my hand on the bark of my favourite. It feels rough, like the scab on my forehead from when I fell in the playground. Mum took me to the hospital. They stuck my head back together with sticky sap glue. I kneel on the ground and stretch my fingers into the dark soil roots. The mud is cold and wet. No wonder the trees wear thick green moss socks. When I'm tucked up in bed, when everything is silent, when sleep is far away, I wait, I wait, I wait for the tap, tap, tap at my window. Tap, 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 tap. I climb over shadows onto the windowsill and draw back my curtains to see a branch as long as a giant's arm. Slowly tapping the window, to let me know it's there, that I'm safe. It knows because the other trees have whispered through the ground. I was in the woods today. Thanks. Uh, and uh, I'm going quite fast. I think we'll be done within half an hour. Well, maybe in 25 minutes. Um, and the next poem I'm gonna read again is another poem from, um, another anthology that I was in last year. Um, it's a, a, a running anthology. Um, uh, I'll share the details of these in the video afterwards. And um, I was really glad to be in this poem because maybe people, um, what you can't see maybe is the wheelchair that's below um, me and Kate actually <laughs> in the screen. Um, and um, yeah, I'm a wheelchair user and I've, um, I've done lots of uh, 10Ks, half marathons, marathons. I have a, a racing wheelchair that I uh, kneel in rather than sit in and uh, you push and it enables you to do um, long distance races. And um, people have asked me before, you know, what do you say when you go out for a, a wander? And I still say I go for a walk. I still say I go for a run because um, when I get in the water, I still go for a swim. Um, and when I get in the car, I go for a drive. So why can't I go for a walk? And why can't I go for a run? And uh, this poem is about still being able to run in a wheelchair. It's called Running Together in Greenwich Park. I bring us here to run away. 20 years of sitting in the wheelchair has left you fused like a sprinter, crouched on the starting line, legs bent, eager for the gun. I pull running tights over fatless thighs, slide a vest over circus strongman chest, tie laces, limber, stretch. Are you ready to be lifted from day wheelchair to racing wheelchair, four wheels to three, to fold into position? We share the same skin, wheelchair user, runner. Is this a single experience 
The early morning is empty, like the chasm that follows the words, you'll never walk again. I drew autumnal mist back beyond bare branches. I stop pushing, see if you will take up the effort. We drift almost to a standstill. Something approaching sadness applies a break. It takes strength, not made in a gym, to release it. We pass the empty bandstand. There's the sound of brass. They came to play for us. Do you hear it? This is where we won the city. If you ask me, is it still running? If our legs don't move, I'll say yes. Though I can't be sure you're still listening. Thanks. Um, and that's my uh, penultimate poem. I've got time for one more poem. I guess if anyone's got any questions, put them in the comment. Um, thank you to anyone who's, um, who's joined this. Thank you very much to Kate for um, uh, her BSL interpreting. Uh, hopefully we can do more of this. Hopefully it's great to be able to show that with a split screen, you can do um, BSL and uh, people can still ac po access poetry. Uh, and we'll share this video afterwards. Uh, this last poem, um, I'd want to share, um, I'm a member of something called Zoe Glossier. Um, Zoe Glossier is a, an organization um, that's based in America. Uh, it's for um, poets with disabilities and uh, it's in its second year. And um, last year, um, they, uh, I joined as a fellow, went to America. And um, this year, more poets have joined and we were meant to be in America. And the reason why I'm talking about Zoe Glossier is um, they've just reopened their application process because um, they've recognised and accepted that they need to do more to encourage um, black poets with disabilities to join Zoe Glossier, um, to be given a platform to be able to read their poems about their experiences as being a black person with a disability. Um, and again, in the video, when I share this, I'll share details on how people can do that. I think it's really important. Um, I also think it's really important that they have recognised that they um, haven't necessarily got the application process right. Um, I think as a, as a white poet, I feel very strongly that if we're going to be a diverse group of poets, we need to be uh, diverse to, to everybody. And um, yeah, if you're um, a black poet with a disability, please do apply to Zoe Glossier. Um, there's funding available in terms of support that can be given. Uh, and it's really important. And hopefully at some point in the future, um, I'm hoping to get someone from Zoe Glossier onto a spoken pencil session, if we can get the time difference right. And we have an honest conversation about um, this and why this has happened and uh, how we can try and address this in the future. Um, yeah, anyway, so I will read the poem. And this is a poem about, uh, I, wrote, I wrote this, um, when I was remembering what it was like when I went to America last year uh, and I flew out there on my own and I remembered what it was like to uh, say goodbye to someone that you love and that you're going to miss and um, the little uh, idiosyncrasies that they have and uh, the little things that you love about them and that annoy you about them and how you're going to miss them in the time that you're away. And this poem is called When We Say Goodbye, We Talk Too Fast. Silence asks for two shots, oat milk, extra hot, the usual. The day is four hours out of bed, but you wake only when caffeine has been consumed. You take the reusable in both hands, wrap fingers around warming plastic like a hungry body stretched across the shoreline. The coffee speaks. Tomorrow, turn away from the sun, look towards the moon. I inhale four self-measured goodbyes. Later, when the caffeine is left, I watch you. My ritual. You stand in the bedroom that's actually an office, which is actually now a gym, but really where we keep our laundry and our glitter and our lycra. You take out hair grips, which you won't find again, remove dance class glitter and moisturize. You do all this whilst gazing out the window at the lighthouse beam, a full 250 million miles from Earth. Your ritual. Tomorrow, a passport apart, when I look past rooftops and connect night sky dots, our shadows will join and next week we'll be alive. Thank you.
they were on my points. I actually think I've got two questions. So if you're okay to stay on, Kate, I will see if I can find these questions. Uh, a question from yeah. Maya. So when will your post-apocalyptic poems be available anywhere? Thanks, Maya. Good question. Um, I'm hoping I can find a home for them. Um, I'm trying to write. Um, I did an amazing workshop with um, Roger Robinson. Uh, I've mentioned Roger Robinson before on the Spoken Pencil Sessions. Um, he wrote uh, a book which came out this year called A Portable Paradise. Or did it come out last year? Uh, a Portable Paradise tells the story of people who lost their lives and uh, in the Grenfell tragedy. And um, it's a phenomenal book. But uh, Roger said that when he writes a poetry collection, he aims for about 150 poems and then he whittles it down to maybe 50 or 60 that make it into the final cut. And he said, get your first drafts down. Write a poem a day or as many poems as you can do and just get your first drafts down. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. I think I've written about 50 or so poems that could um, be part of that process. And I want to aim really for about 80. Um, and then I'll start to think about how they might turn into a collection. And then hopefully there's a home for those. And if there is a home for them, they'll come out next year. So thank you, Mike. Good question. And uh, this is a question from Project HB, who's also my wife uh, and was the person I was talking about in that last point. Um, what stuck out in your mind as something you've been able to access because it's gone online during lockdown? Uh, so much, so much good stuff. Um, I would say fitness classes. I um, tend to only go to gyms that I can access if they're wheelchair accessible. But now I've been doing uh, yoga uh, with people in America. As I said at the start, um, I've been able to uh, access workshops and poetry readings. I've been able to watch gigs um, from people that you um, love and admire and think are fantastic. And they're sat in their bedroom playing a keyboard. Um, uh, yeah. And that's all been great. I really miss going to the cinema. I miss sitting in a big comfy chair. I miss the smell of popcorn. I miss trailers. Uh, I miss getting annoyed at people slurping a drink, which I never thought I would do. Um, but yeah, um, so much stuff has been opened up. Um, I've also enjoyed making my own hot chocolate, which as, a, as an aside. Anyway, um, thank you so much for joining. I will share this video afterwards. Um, and thank you so much to Kate. It's been a pleasure having you on signing. Hopefully we can do this again. And uh, there'll be more Spoken Pencils to sessions to come. Uh, join in and thank you. Bye. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.